Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're ripe, you rot. Let's get started. Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director podcast. This is episode number 88, entitled Maximizing Rehearsal Time, and I'm here with my friend Jeff Smith and Tony Susi. Jeff, how are you? Great. How are you? Oh, fantastic. Good. Just finished school. It's awesome. Tony, great to meet you today. Yeah, thanks for having me on the program. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. So um, how long were you a music educator in Connecticut? Well, I still am. I, I consider myself you know, okay. I'm not full time. But yeah, since 1985, I've been teaching in Connecticut. Yeah. Close to 40 years. Yeah, this is year 38. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the prep, the reason we're doing this episode was because of your connection with Jeff, but also you have a clinic coming up on rehearsal techniques uh, at Midwest this year, correct? Yeah, I'm excited. First time presenting yeah. at Midwest. Um, I've had some of my music perform, but not presenting myself. So yeah. very excited. Quite an honor. Yeah. I'm yeah. So, forward. so we're going to go through a lot of the things that you're presenting with that, and uh, this can be your trial run. <laughs> sure. Appreciate. It. Like I said, I really do appreciate this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's great. Um, so, as a as a, a teacher and a composer, I mean, your bio is longer than mine will ever be. Um, is there anybody you haven't published with is what I want to know. It seems like there's a, there's a lot of people. Yeah. Here. yeah. I, I've been, I've been working, uh, I don't know if you know, Brian Balmage's sure. FJH, he left and went to Alfred. And but I think, I think Alfred now picked up FJH because Brian was like half the catalog, but, um, yeah, so I'm not with, with Alfred yet. And, and Brian's been great. Um, ironically, two pieces that I had played one string and one, um, band piece at Midwest this past year, he had pieces on the same program as did Randall. So we sat together twice and, 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 and chatted a lot. And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, send me your stuff. And, and, and he's been great about giving me really good feedback on the, on the material I've sent. Um, he's passed on stuff, but I get it. Like he's, he's helping me fine tune what it is that'll, that'll fit, you know, their catalog. So. Sure. Yeah. I, I've been listening to some of your music recently and getting ready for this. And there's a piece I came across that I really liked that I would, I would hope some people would buy and, and, and listen to. It's a piece called Harvest Time. Oh, yeah. And, that was uh, one, that was one of the ones. That was actually the first piece I ever had played at Midwest. The year that came out. Yeah. Thank you. Great. The imagery in that is great. You can tell you're at a, you know, a country fair, basically. Yeah. It was a Ram High School Commission in Ram and Hebron, Connecticut, that they have their Harvest Fair every year, the, the Hebron Fair. So hence the title and the whole subject matter to fit that. Yeah. I, I'm going to keep listening and hopefully we play that soon. Um, all right. So Jeff, question for you. Okay. What makes Tony uh, a tremendous educator? Well, I met Tony back in 1986 and uh, all the time that I was there from 86 till 2010, his exuberance, he was never somebody to take things lackadaisically. He always was aggressive about teaching things very positively, engaging kids. And at the same time, he was writing a ton of music at the same time. So he was a very active uh, educator and very involved with CMEA and his band program. And I was impressed. Great. Well, thank you. I was impressed. You were president of CMEA, right? If I'm right, Jeff? I was president in 90 and 91. Yeah. 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 86, yeah. I was student affairs chairman. And then you were very active in CMEA. Yeah. CMEA was a great place to be. Still is. <laughs> Okay, Tony. So now a question for you. Yeah. Um, as an experienced educator, what lessons would you give your younger teacher self that might be helpful for younger teachers as well? I think the first, uh, for my presentation, there's like six categories. And the very first one, which is learn to relinquish control and delegate tasks. That's hard to do when you first start. At least it was for me. You know, you think you got all the answers and you, you want things done the way you want them done. And 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 I was trying to do it all. And I was I was burning myself out rather quickly. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, that's an understatement. But mm -hmm. that's true. And then little by little, I started realizing, hey, you know, got to learn to relinquish some of these tasks that other people can do, students particularly, 
um, that it's not my band, but it's our band, you know, that that whole mindset and make giving ownership to them by giving sure. them opportunities. And of course the parents and the music booster group relinquishing more things to them and, and letting me do just the music piece and, and, and letting them handle all the other logistical stuff that I was trying to do. Yeah. Freeing, freeing you up to do what you're best at. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so what are some of the, what are some examples of some of those jobs that you could pass on to people? Yeah, I would think a lot of bands uh, do this or, or performing ensembles, but student officers and whether you do it on a permanent basis for the year or at the middle school level, you might do it on a rotating monthly basis and whatever works for you. But basically, uh, I would have like a class librarian who would handle the music piece because uh, kids would always come into rehearsal and somebody would be like, oh, I left my folder home today. I need the part or I lost my part or and, and, you know, I, I'm not going to be running around and scrambling to get them music so they can play. They, they just, students would know, go to the librarian when you need music that you lost or misplaced or left home. Sure. And even distributing music. When I used to get sucked into passing out music in rehearsal, what a waste of time, you know. Um, got the Wenger folder slots and said, guys, here's your mailbox. Check your mail every day when you come in. If there's new music, it's going to be in there. If there's notices that got to go out, it's going to be in there. Um, you know, so that's the kind of thing the librarian would do. Equipment manager. Kids that come in, oh, I need a read. You know, I don't have any, my reads broken, I don't have any reads, or I need valve oil, or I I, I, I lost one drumstick, or whatever that piece is. Again, you can get sucked into scrambling around, trying to find all these things, because you want the kids to be able to participate in the class, but you're eating up time. So students know they, they arrive to class, they go to the equipment manager for those things. They don't come to me for that. Um, class accountant would handle things like, you know, collecting permission slips, passing out fundraiser information. Again, all these things that, that are important are a part of the program, but it takes away from rehearsal time. So they would handle that. Um, section leaders take attendance in the section and then just report attendance to me. So, you know, it was power school was something, Jeff, did you have to do power school before you retired? That that was- It started near the end, yeah. Yeah, same for me. And boy, that's a lot of extra work. Like yeah. it was like every class you had a Go on to power school and send your attendance in before you, you did anything. And for a classroom, regular teacher, like a class of 20 something, that's pretty quick. A band, you got 80 kids in the room. That's not so quick. You know, um, sure. there's one example of, of that. So, yeah, having having positions, offices, whatever you want to call them, um, that students do is really yeah. helpful. Yeah. I, uh, I was at a clinic once by Barbara McLean at NAFME, Nash, All Nationals, and uh, her 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 clinic was basically about this. It was about here is all these things that can save you 30 seconds a day, mm -hmm. two minutes a day. And she did the math and she's like, if you do this, 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 and this, say you saved five minutes of rehearsal. Okay. And then you multiply that by the hundred rehearsals you had. And she said at the end of the year, you'd have an extra 500 minutes mm -hmm. of rehearsal if you just did this. And that sort of hit it home for me. What were, what were some of the things you did in this? Round well, round? I did very similar to Tony. I, I, I had uh, section leaders who helped me, but my first, four minutes of rehearsal were warm-ups. So I'd start warm-ups and then I'd go over to the computer and section leaders would raise their hand if they knew somebody that was absent and they'd point to the chair and I just knew who it was and took care of that for the attendance and uh, music librarian, yeah, the uh, section leaders. And then I have had a huge band parent association and they did, they let me teach. And it did all the work for me. I just would meet with them once a month and say, this is what I'd like you to try to do for me. They'd arrange all my buses for me. I taught them how to do it, where to go. They took care of all my financial accounting for the band program for me. Uh, permission slips, we got it near the end where everything was done electronically. Everything was sent home and they just signed it from home and sent it back in. So we went from there uh, because as we all know, if you pass out a permission slip and band, you have a 50-50 chance that it gets home but if you send electronically to mom and dad well you have you have a 75 percent chance yeah. that you're going to get it back in time that was and, one of the nice things like, power school is you could you could communicate with right that's my upsides of parents electronic right all that kind of stuff was all there yeah and librarian yeah i i never touched the stuff the like kids took care of the whole library for me and then i'd go in and assess them and that would be part of you know if you've if you volunteered to be the librarian that your midterm exam and your final exam could be exempt if you've done an exemplary job taking care of the library. And um, so it worked out well. It's, it's spend more time teaching and less time doing administrative work that uh, just wasted time. 
Yeah, another thing for equipment manager, I always, I should say, I always, most of my jobs, except for the years I was at Bennett, was a shared band room, like the middle school, high school band director shared oh. the same room. Uh, that was in Haddam Killingworth, that was in Coventry. And so the previous class that was in there had a different setup, you know, chairs, percussion things moved around, or there was a concert they had the night before, so stuff was on stage. And so get the student who's the first always to arrive to class. Those are the perfect people for equipment manager. And they would start fixing the chairs and stands. Yep. And anything that can be done in advance or when the, as the students are walking in that doesn't, like you said, use up that valuable rehearsal time. I was lucky. I had my own room, but my equipment managers, when they came into school in the morning, knew that their job was to make sure the chairs and stands, percussion equipment were all put in the appropriate places so that when rehearsal started, because I, I was tough on them. When the bell rang, you had to be in your seat with your instrument in your hands ready to play. If you weren't, I marked you tardy for class. It wasn't you could nonchalantly come in and have a little chat, you know, we're going to start. It was like the bell rang at 205, class starts exactly at 205. In class, if class got over at 245, well, at 244, you could put your instrument away because we've already done our final announcements and we've done our warm down and we're ready to go on to class. Yeah. Utilizing time to its most efficient factor. Yeah, what, what motivated me to do this, want to do this session, um, was with fantastic festivals that I adjudicate for, talking to the directors, you, you hear the same thing. And I always just say the same thing. You know, we're, we're very critical of our own groups, which you should be. And be like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, we, we, we did pretty good. If we just had one or two more rehearsals, you know, we wouldn't. And, and I was like, always feeling that way. I'm like, yep, that's always felt like there was, if you just had a couple more rehearsals, so you start got to start saying to yourself, well, what's wrong with this picture, you know? And then they're looking at all the reasons why. Uh, so yeah, that was the yeah, because you you were said like you said at the beginning, two minutes here, two minutes there, times five days a week, times six weeks, seven weeks. Well, that's a, a class a class and a half or more. It's a lot of time. Yeah. So so in your um, Midwest presentation called pedagogical practices to maximize precious rehearsal time. Looks like part two is all about preparation. Yeah. And w one thing that I'm going to outline here that I, uh, all of this is great. And I know we'll talk about it is the, when you're prepping your score, learning it enough and getting your eyes out of the score. I was talking last week with Jeff Leonard from Lexington uh, high school. And he, we, and I mentioned even just getting the score out of the way when you're rehearsing, even if you don't know it all, maybe as well mm -hmm. as you need to, but it's a, I'm just amazed at how well you hear the band when you're not looking at the music. So that's just something that's amaz amazing to me. And when I watch them play, I feel like I hear them them even better. Yeah, and yeah. I, think, I think the other part is how often have you judged a festival where you're watching the conductor and their head is down like this the whole time? Well, then you've not prepped your material for the kids to go into festival. Yeah. And, and part of the prep for me, which has always been good, um, and this comes from having the opportunity. I know Jeff, you have too, to to guest conduct the honor band festivals and things like that, where you just have two, you know, two rehearsals. And then I've even had festivals where the first one was snowed out, so you had one rehearsal, and then you got to put out. The <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you got to be super efficient. There's no waste of time. So the whole idea of anticipating, the better you get at anticipating where, where they're going to have trouble, where they're going to trip and fall. Then when it happens, you've already got in your head this first, then this two and this third, like strategies in, already lined up how you're going to approach fixing yep. that. Um, and you're just ready to go versus waiting till you hear it. And then like you're on the podium, you got to think on your feet. Oh, let me, you know, let's try this. Let's try that. That's not yeah. effective. Um, and my mindset always was assume the students did not practice. You know, I just you, you want them to practice and, and some do. But a lot, yeah, I just assume, OK, wherever it sounded like the last rehearsal, that's in my mind. That's the band I'm going to see the next time I see them. Don't expect that they went home and even them, they would do it sometimes, but just anticipate that they're not. They didn't do it and anticipate where they're going to trip and fall and have strategies already ready to go. Terry White told me that the same the same thing many yeah. years ago. Well, the, the thing I always used was that practice what you the kids don't know. Don't waste your time practicing what the kids do know because you can get much more work done. Yeah, that, that we get into that in, in the actual part four of the rehearsals. Um, maybe just think something. Years. Oh, but the eyes out of the score. So for me, the aha moment was that, but way back at heart, 
um, Dr. Alvarez was the director, conductor of this uh, wind ensemble. And I used to be amazed that, you know, wind ensemble, we had 45, 50 kids in there. And he would, he could stop and say, oh, Tony, you, you missed that F sharp. Or he'd say the trombone, you're flat on that A. Or you, and so one day after rehearsal, I went up to him and said, man, your ear, how do you get your ears to be that, that good? You can hear those individual things. He goes, I didn't hear it because I saw it. He goes, I'm, I'm looking to write the, I That's see right. wrong finger. I saw that trombone position was, wasn't close exactly enough right. to position. And I was just like, I was thinking all this time he was hearing these things, but he said, not half the time I'm, you know, especially, I've seen especially if, especially if you know third trumpets are, the ones with a third of the chord and you know, they're the ones who are probably going to miss the F sharp. So when you get to that note, you're every looking time. in that direction yep. every time. <laughs> yep. Uh, Trombone player that's supposed to be in seventh position and you see him in third or, or first, first, you're saying, yeah, what are you doing? Oh no, I played that B natural. Yeah. First, right. You did. You did. Right. Yeah. Yes, you yeah. You did. <laughs> I actually color code my scores, all the accidentals that I think they're going to miss or slide positions. Yeah. I put them just in red so that when I, as soon as they are a bad note, I see the red, I can know, right. Where it came from, what I even haven't seen it because I know what you know. Yeah. You know where it's coming from. And I, the color coding thing I used to do the same thing. I had all my I had my yellow, blue, orange, purple, and green. And you look, you'd be looking at a rainbow down when you look down. But all you did is you looked down quickly and you saw the color. You said, "Oh yeah, I know what that is. I don't need to go and look what the note was. I know that that's a problem area." Yeah. And and in this section of preparation, you also have rehearsal outline and reminders on the board music prep and room prep yeah that we mentioned already about the room prep where your, your equipment managers can yeah. come in and make sure that the room is ready to go enough chairs enough stands percussion stuff is where it belongs um the, i've mentioned about using the folder slats is their mailbox mm -hmm. and if the music's already pre-passed out or any handouts mm -hmm. already there um let me see if there's anything else I'm just in there. There's also one other thing I do a lot of times. If there's an example of a piece of repertoire that I want them to listen to, mm -hmm. maybe it's a piece we're playing. Maybe it's a piece we're going to play. Maybe it's the original version of a piece we're playing or something. You know, when they're coming in, I'll have that on, right? Mm -hmm. Playing over the speakers. Yeah, so all the time. Yep. By the time they're sitting, all of a sudden you get to then explain and you have on the board, this is Carmina Burana or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And that's just, I call that secondhand smoke. Yeah, you know, I used it's to like do it all day They're not actually school. sitting and listening, but it's, it's getting in there. You know, I and, like the one where you put like, rehearsal outline on the board and everything. Too often you walk in when you're guest conducting and you see nothing on the board and you say, oh, did you clean the board off? Oh, no, I just I just use it when I need it. Whereas I know in my class when you walked in, you had to, there was so much stuff on the board, you had to look carefully at it as well as a calendar of all the events coming up and mm -hmm. so that you didn't have to waste your time talking about it. You just point to it and say, that's your responsibility. That's part of your grade. Make sure you do it. And for percussionists, too, yep. if the rehearsal's on the board, they know, oh, we're going to be doing these pieces, and they, they're responsible to make sure they get that equipment and those mallets and stuff ready. Otherwise, the transitions, transitions are huge in rehearsal. Yep. You can lose so much time um, if, if there's not a smooth transition that the, the kids are suddenly surprised. Oh, let's go to this piece now. Oh, and they, you know, and I, and I was big about not having the same kids play, you know, first chair or first part in every song. So they had to play the musical chair game and the percussions had to reset up. But if they saw on the board, it was common the anticipation, you know, it helps. Yeah, and, the, and a lot of groups were, I know for me, where we'd have the list of pieces and we'd have the percussion assignments typed and they'd be posted on the back board yep. where the percussion is. So they knew if it's a new piece, oh, I'm playing snare. Oh, I'm playing timpani here. Oh, I'm playing yep. marimba, what have you. Yeah, I, I was I always wanted to rotate my percussionists through. I didn't want the strong players always grabbing the snare part and the tim part. I made sure they all got to play in mal parts. Everybody rotated through, but I would do that rotation for that concert coming up right from day one. So they already knew and yep. in this concert, this is you know, they had a sheet that was in their folder. Who's playing what and all the parts? And then if somebody was absent, they knew what was missing and you know what to cover. But yeah, that was that was decided before the music even went out. You know, it's funny, as you talk about the slots, I have an adult community band that I teach in New Hampshire, and we have the librarian takes the folder for each section, puts all the parts in the folders, and it's the section leader's job to make sure they go through every rehearsal if there's new stuff to go out and pass it out to the section so no time is wasted in rehearsal trying to get music delivered. Yeah. It's there in color-coded folders for them. You, uh, Tony, you alluded earlier about not having all your best players play first all the time. Mm -hmm. So that sort of takes us into, so what are some different things you used to do when it came to seating arrangements, how you seated the band and what else yeah, you was, did? 
Part three. Yep. Yeah. Good segue there. Good yeah, segue. man. I got you. Yeah. Um, for the longest time, I always rehearsed in concert setup because it was, it's, it's like you teach the way you were, you were taught, you know, so when I was at heart, we always sat in concerts seating, you know, and rehearsed mm-hmm. all the time. When I was in school and high school, we sat in concert seating until there was this one festival I had to do. It was uh I'll never forget Northern region. I think that year, the, the school that offered to, you know, you're at the mercy of whoever's willing to host was mm-hmm. East Catholic. And they had this gym that was like a, a airplane hangar. It had the big arching <laughs> metal roof. Oh, over I remember it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so the band was rehearsing in this, this airplane hangar is what I called it. And within two minutes rehearsing, I'm like, oh my God, I can't hear past the, the second row. I hear flutes, and some clarinets, and then nothing from the low brass. And tr- I just can't hear it. So I'm in a panic mode. I'm like thinking, I'm like, how am I going to make this work? So I, I, I recorded it. I always do this the first day. I'll, I'll record what's going on and go home and stand, listen to it. Stay up pretty late because I know the next day I want to go in knowing what needs to be done. And I was like, came in the next day and I had tubas up front. You know, basically I flipped the band and the kids are like, what are we doing? I'm like, trust me. I said, I yesterday I couldn't hear anything was going on. Now I can hear the front, the back of the band. I get up front. And then when we have our our dress rehearsal run through, we'll, we'll put it back. Yeah. And after that point on, I was like, why don't I do this all the time? You know, th- that's why the flutes are so well behaved. Generally, you know, the stereotype, they're in front row. They know you can hear and see everything. And why the trumpets who I'm guilty party or the hacker, you know, goofing around with the percussion because you're furthest from the, the conductor. I move percussion up when they have an important part. Bring the timpani up here today or bring the snare right here. Right. Like right next Good to idea. me. Uh, um, why not? Why, why do they have to be way back there all the time? Um, so yeah. Yeah. And depending I, on your room, you can do a box or a circle. Yeah. You know, the circle is great the uh, with a big band. It was I, circles were great with jazz band because they were small enough to, to be in a big circle. I like that a little more difficult with concert band, but the kids knew that I would rotate. What section is going to be in the front row today? Oh, today altos are in the front row. Uh, today trombones are in the front row. That was, um, it really, it opens up your ears. You hear so many other things you couldn't hear if you just constantly rehearse and, and the kids hear differently too. Um, and one of them in that part of rehearsal technique section of the, of the, the uh, presentation, but well, we can talk about it now. Scrambled eggs. Um, that's like, that's the nickname I called it. The kids have to sit where nobody on either side of them is playing their part because they get comfortable relying on people on either side of them for how the rhythm goes or when to make an entrance. They're not counting the rest. They, but when you've got people all around you that aren't playing the same part, you have to be more independent. But your ears are hearing parts you don't hear. If you're always okay. sitting in the same spot, um, and I'll date myself here with this, but you guys, uh, the the Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams. And I always bring this up and some of the kids go, what are you talking about? Like, oh, Watch the movie. I'm sure it's on Netflix or something. But the scene that was great was he had all his students come up one day and take a turn standing up on top of his desk. And then he got down the next student had to get up and, and the, he didn't tell him why just, and then the kids like, after they all did it, why did you do this? And he said, because you sit in the same row in the same desk every day and you got the same perspective of the room and what's going on. And now you got this whole new perspective of what it looks like from the top of my desk, looking at the class and, and I use that with the music that if you sit in a different spot in rehearsals, you're going to hear other people. Oh, I didn't realize they have the same part I do. Or I never heard that counter melody that's going on or right. whatever it is. You know. So a twist on what, something you said. If you, the, I always had a tiered band room and it was quite large. And to have everything switch around didn't work real well to get the timpani down front. So what I would do is I'd conduct part of the rehearsal from the front. Then I'd go around to the back of the room and everybody turn their chairs and face me there. And then some days I'd have them all turn their chairs to the right or all turn their chairs to the left so that they physically didn't really move. But I made them do the same thing you're doing, except for the mix up of different parts, which is a whole different thing, which is great. Uh, but I got the same process done without them moving, but me being the moving party and uh, or picking a horn up and going sitting with the trombones and playing with the trombones. And uh, or going picking up a trumpet or a French horn and playing with a different section as the director and having my student drum major just conduct a part so that I could sit with them to see what their problems are, because maybe the problem they're having might not be generated 
the same way we always think that when you're sitting in the euphonium section, play the euphonium part, well, why can't you play along with the tenor sax? And then you come to realize they can't hear the tenor sax where they're mm -hmm. sitting in this room. And I have to figure out a way to make that so they can better hear what they're doing. Yeah, one of the advantages of having uh, student teachers, and that goes back too, to that yeah. or relinquish, relinquishing control and delegating, highly encourage directors to have student teachers. I mean, you just gave a perfect example. They're on the podium. You can go sit in and play with the band and, and do all those things you just said. Um, yeah, it was very beneficial uh, for me to have student teachers. And you're showing the kids that uh, don't try to fake me because if you want me, I'll just come over and play that instrument and sit next to you. And you might not be happy afterwards trying to make me look like I don't know how to play the trombone or how to play the saxophone or the bassoon or the oboe. Yeah, And, and putting another, another strategy I mentioned here is just leaving an aisle right down the middle. Again, yep. in a concert setting, you're not going to have that. that uh, but if there's just this open aisle, you can just walk right to the back of the, of the fourth row and, and show maybe it's something you want. Or a, a kid's having a problem with their instrument. So they like the time get up and they walk all the way around and then they come up to you and they hand you their instrument. You just walk up and while the kids are playing, you can look at it, hand it back. Uh, or get them to feel time playing a section and instead of you standing up there just waving your arms get up into the band in different areas and just walk up and listen to them play from the area in which you're playing yeah they don't need you yeah they don't need us all yeah. the time you know you we mentioned earlier about having parts rotating and different kids covering first second and third uh back about six months ago i met with jeff priest and um he actually passes out all three trumpet parts to every trumpet player hmm. and all three clarinet parts to every clarinet player and vice versa so that when he wanted to work on the third clarinet part, instead of working with just the, the students who were the, the weakest, everybody would play it and learn it. And that would help everybody, everybody learn it, the parts by ear, but also, you know, so what I, when I say by ear, I mean, you know, not they were learning it by ear, but they were like understanding what was happening when they played the piece, they knew what it was supposed to sound like. And that really helped, you know, the third kids learn, learn the part um, as well. So that's something I hadn't done before. Did you ever do that, Tony? Give them all three parts? No, but yeah. what I would look at, again, I always plan my programs, you know, wasn't like a, as we went along and decided, well, let's add this or let's add that. And and there, in every piece, there's going to be a trumpet one, for example, that's higher tessitura or higher, higher range or the tessitura stays up there. And there's some pieces where it's not as demanding. And I would in advance to figure, okay, this is the piece where this player can play first. And this is the one where I need my strongest player. Same mm -hmm. goes with the clarinets, whatever. But you rarely would all the pieces have that same range or the same tessitura where you had to be concerned about that. And if you thought it through ahead of time and you rotate, plus it saves the chops for the kids that got to play the pieces with the really high, high notes. If they're playing the whole concert up there, I've seen that happen too many times. They fizzle out, you know, in the concert. So it's another advantage of rotating them around. Um, or like when you got uh, ASBA, BDA festivals or stuff like that in Connecticut. We used, to, we used to do and have say to the section leaders, before the festival, you need to have four sectionals with your entire section. You're running it. You know what you have to work on. You've heard about it. You have questions, ask me, and have the kids do it so the kids become responsible to one another, showing that they can play their parts. And then we used to play a checkout day where once a week I'd go through like clarinets. Okay, clarinets play measures 76 through 79, one at a time, all the way through. And... Uh, if you didn't play your part right, well, then you moved up a chair. And a couple of times I had last chair clarinet who had been practicing his tail off, move all the way up to first clarinet section and hang there for quite a while because they it would happen regularly. And uh, yeah. it made the kids be, would be aware that you too could get called on at any minute to play your part. So you need to be responsible to yourself and responsible to your, the others. It's just like you said at the beginning, we, me and I versus you and us. Band has to be you and us. Yeah, I had a, a spot check rubric that the kids know we use, and that was just that. They knew at any point to do random spot check, and they knew what the rubric was, and it wouldn't take long. They just, do, 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 okay, and then yeah. Yeah. parts could change. <laughs> so another uh, reason to not always have the best players playing the first part. I, I, I grew up in a, a small town in Connecticut, and we had a small band, 40-something, some odd players, 45 players. Um so I was I was playing first trumpet all the time. And it was great. Okay, I love it. First trumpet. I get to heart. I'm not the best player. I'm on third trumpet. My ears could not 
here where those harmonies should fall. I was constantly on the wrong partials. It was making me crazy because when you're playing first, you got the melody all the time. You know where 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 the partials are going to fall. Mm -hmm. And when you're playing those inner harmonies that I didn't have any experience doing, all of a sudden I'm struggling. I'm like, I'm struggling on the second and third parts. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, ah, you know, it, it does the kids a favor to not always play the melody parts, the best players. Uh, kind of hurt. Right. That's great. So so Jeff said he used a four minute warm up. That's a very Jeff number. It's good. I'm sure it wasn't three minutes and 24 seconds. No, I'll tell you exactly. It was four minutes okay. on the button. Um, I still use it. Yeah. So I just think that whatever number you use works for that works for you and your kids. I just think it's so important that people do a warm up and a consistent warm up, but not. So what's the word? A consistent, consistently warm up, but change how you warm up mm -hmm. so that it's not predictable. Yeah. Because if you play that concert B flat scale, if they're just going through the motions and, and you're not even playing a concert B flat that day. What are you doing? You're wasting time. And then I have a, I have a teacher who I won't mention long time ago, this teacher I observed at one point every day, it was a concert, a flat scale in double whole notes. That's eight beats for everybody counting along at home for two octaves. Want to do long times, bro. two octaves concert, a flat scale every day, double whole notes. And it was like, Gordon, I mean, they were like, <laughs> they were just checked out, period. Yeah. So. He was doing it for a long time, to, to, to obviously, to build embouchures and endurance. But if you but. do that every day, it's like, yeah. So my thing with warm-ups is, and I again, observing um, bands, fantastic festivals warm up before they're about to play. And, and um, knowing that this is probably how they rehearse. You can save a ton of time if the warm-up is going to reinforce whatever the main objective is in your rehearsal that day so if there's first of all warm up in the key the first piece you're going to play warm up in that key why warm up be in, in concert a flat if you're playing a, a piece in concert f you know like you're not acclimating them to that so start with the, the same key of the first piece then if there's a tricky rhythm pattern they're going to be coming across that you're going to be focusing on instead of playing the thing in whole notes two whole notes tied whatever put the, the rhythm pattern should be on the board and even maybe it's a part that only the clarinets and altos have it, but everybody learns that rhythm pattern while they're playing the scale. And you can address that in the warm up. And then when you go to the piece, the rhythm's already fixed and they're acting to the key. Articulation, if it's an articulation pattern, give them an articulation pattern that you want, again, right out of the piece, put it into the, whatever the eighth notes are doing in the scale or something. It just make, make it so that, like I said, it's reinforcing. Uh, sure. What you're going to rehearse, don't just arbitrarily, let's do this corral. Corrals are great, you know, but it, the corral, if the issue that they're having is this odd meter that they're playing in, find a warm up that's going to reinforce playing in 5-4 or something, whatever it is, you know, yeah. like my my warm ups, I always try to make sure that they they prepped for the day's rehearsal. Now it's just that the, the warm up is yes, the warm up, the instrument physically, that's another thing I have in there about the part of the warm up, tuning. The directors that go around and tune everybody before they've warmed up a waste of time, as yeah. we know, because the instruments aren't warmed up yet and the pitch is going to change as soon as they start getting warm. Never wasted time going around with the tuner tuning everybody. We'd warm up, we'd start to play, tune on a need basis as you start to hear, oh, altos, let's stop, tune. Continue on, oh, flutes, let's stop, tune. On a need basis as you go. Otherwise, the kids, like you said, check out. You tune at the beginning, they think I'm all good to go. <laughs> they yeah. stopped listening because you tuned me already. I don't need to retune. It's like, no, you got to get it out of their head that there's a constant adjustment, you know? My struggle has always been there's like so much to get into a warm up. You know, I do this, 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 and this, but we didn't work on major scales that are outside of the key we're on. And then I do that. And it's like, okay, now we didn't do corrals. Okay, if I incorporate a corral, then I forgot the articulation exercise. And then it's just like, to me, I, I want a 35 minute warm up. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, I think also the thing that a lot of our colleagues forget is that, especially our woodwind colleagues and percussion colleagues, you need to warm the group down. If you've been working the heck out of the kids, especially the brass players, and they go home, leave class, and their lips and muscles are all tight as a rock, that's not making them better players down the road. That's teaching them to feel incorrectly after they play and teaching them that you should always warm up and you should always warm up when you're warming down, when you're practicing at home and at school. Because I know we will guilty. Yeah, yeah. I have to say sometimes you know, teach right up to the to the bell to pack up and then yep. give time for a cool down, you know, with the brass chops 
We did a two minute. We did a quick two minute warm down. The woodwind players would look at me, why? And I'd say, because. Just do it. <laughs> so tuning or, you know, it's, it needs to be oral, not visual. I mean, you can use the visual too, but my, again, my experience in high school, I'm going to date myself. We, this is before even the cord tuners. We had the, the, the strobe, Jeff, you remember the orange oh, yes. strobe the, the, thing? The, the strobe we, from hell. We wanted yes. to make the checker stand still on the spinning strobe. And if you saw the, the, the chessboard, you, you, you were in tune. So that's how we tune. We would just keep adjusting it until we, till it, <laughs> And we got one note right, and then there's all those other notes. <laughs> but even then, I was getting it right visually. I wasn't doing it right. by exactly. ear. So my my, I was terrible. My pitch was really horrible. Again, went to heart. I'm like, oh man, I I was the worst uh, violator of being out of tune for for the longest time because I had to learn to got to do it by ear. Mm -hmm. um, and and the more you sing with your band, the better off they'll be with that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in, in studying your presentation, you're doing for Midwest. It looks to me like the section on rehearsal is the lengthiest. Yeah. And there's the, I mean, I read through this and my preparation was I, I circled each one that I really uh, dug that I was like, yep, I really either didn't know that or that's amazing or I really like that. And I circled like nine out of 10 of them. So <laughs> it's, it, there's just so much here. I don't even know where to start. But I did want to mention um, one of these about modeling passages. You know, I, I, I had a Phil Snedeker come into the room one time. And famous trumpet player down from your neck of the woods, right? I think. And uh, he came up, he was giving lessons to some of our kids. It was like a one day thing. And he noticed my trumpet was on the, was next to the podium. And he's like, you must be one heck of a band director. I was like, why, first of all, thank you. But why do you say that? He's like, well, your trumpet's right next to the podium. So many band directors don't play for their kids. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, thank you. Modeling's the, one of the most important things. The other thing on your thing is no idle time. Yeah, A band that's idle is a band that misbehaves. Mm -hmm. A band that has no idle time because they're always working doesn't have time to misbehave. Yeah. And this, this strategy under the idle, you know, well, how do you do that? First of all, buzzing mouthpieces for brass players is like the best thing. And, and I never was asked to do that till I got the heart. And in my lessons with Roger Murphy, he's like, dude, Put the trumpet down. <laughs> We're going to just work work this mouthpiece for a while. Mm -hmm. And the same thing that when I switched to euphonium halfway through at heart, I had Steve Perry. Same thing, man. Just work with the mouthpiece. So you're doing them a favor, first of all, because it's getting the focus. They're buzzing it and, and their tone and their pitch and all. But having the, the brass players buzz their part while you were working with the woodwinds. Do that. You know, a percussionist. Flip your sticks around, you know, or, or whatever. Play, play on the rim. Uh, play on the side of the, the instrument. Don't play on the head so it's not as loud, but still play through your part. Have them in, engaged, you know, while you're another, another you can use finger for drummers along. Too. There's another trick you can use for drummers. If you said flip the sticks, if they flip the sticks so the tips are facing in, and then but they're holding the same place, so the, and then they play against their forearms, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good way to do it too. I used to have the black pads that they throw on top of their drums so they could play there. Yeah, and the kids them. who couldn't do that, they said, that's why you have legs. Yep. Play in your legs. Yeah. Yeah. Those black drums, those were great. We had those too. Yeah. Um, and that way, if you had, if you had too many kids in a band and you didn't want to hear four snare drummers, well, you'd had one snare drummer and four black pads playing so that they knew that they were still playing the parts. And any one time they could be called upon to play their part on the drum without the pad. Yeah. The, the biggest one, I think, uh, on this list for a rehearsal, and this one's from having had 40 plus student teachers over the, the 30 years, Watching the student teachers struggle in rehearsals, it doesn't just come naturally at first. But that is when you're prepping the score, unless you're doing a grade four or higher piece, there's, there's going to be a formula. So at some point, that melody the clarinets have is going to be in the low brass and later it's going to be in the trumpets. So when you want to address the phrasing of that or you want to address the dynamic shaping of it or the articulation, don't. And they would do this. They, when they first came across it, they'd work on it with the clarinets and talk about idle time. Everybody else is sitting there twiddling their thumbs while you're helping the clarinets. Now everybody plays. You get to later in the piece where the trombones don't have it. Now you're addressing that rhythm that they were the clarinets. Are, but they weren't paying attention when you did it with the clarinets because you weren't addressing them. So mm -hmm. the color coding, as Jeff mentioned, I would highlight who had who had what in the same spot. And it's okay. 
flute start at 54 trumpets start at 75 you know the travel and at the yep. same time you go over where they have the same rhythm or the same melodic part with the same phrasing and you save it the most time that's where you save the most time and you're most efficient too because because yep. you don't have the idleness and then the misbehavior that results but that's my biggest thing in rehearsal is how many ways or places can I have multiple people playing that later will have it independently. And how many times have you gotten to that situation where, okay, the trumpets will say, well, I'm starting an F and the clarinets are starting B flat. I said, well, I guess we're going to play in fifths, but we're going to get the same articulation. We're going to set the same phrasing. We're going to get the same melodic contour, but we'll be in fourths and fifths so that you can do it the same way. And then I used to use the trick where I'd say to the, if there was a clarinet section that was playing something and somebody repeated, I want you to pick one note all of you together and play it wrong. And I'm going to say to everybody, he said, when it comes to your turn, if if the clarinets play that wrong, you got to play the same wrong note so it sounds right. So they'd sit there and say, oh, and then they say, okay, an F sharp. Maybe it's an F sharp. And they'll play an F sharp. And I said, that's because you have to use your ears to listen, and you're adjusting to what you previously heard. The um, divide and conquer is a technique that, and a lot of these things too, I learn from student teachers. I, I can't say that, that I'm always teaching them. They would come in and show me things because they're sure. learning from how their directors. I had people from Hart and UConn and UMass and even you uh, think UB. Um, anyways, they're coming in with different experiences. But the divide and conquer, band just counts off in twos. All right, just the twos play right now. And the ones, you're sitting right next to them. You listen. And then when they finish playing this passage, Give them your feedback about, oh, you heard th this rhythm and you can help them or uh, you misfingered this. Or, okay, now the ones play it, twos, you listen. And then they're talk about the ownership piece. That's it's a great idea. Yep. They're, they're, yeah, that's one strategy. The the 32nd fix too is think watching a conductor doing a festival. If they're struggling some technical spot, just say, okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I'm going to step off the podium. Take 30 seconds to work it out. Ask your neighbor if you're not sure of fingering or just yep. practice it right. And you get off the podium, you give them 30 seconds to work on this technical passage or to get help from the, the neighbor. And then you get back up on the podium and it's a lot better. A lot better. Um, instead of you going around into trying to find the individuals that are struggling and working with them. Um, there's, it, there's a couple more in here I really like too. Uh, the rule of three, don't spend too long with any one section in full group rehearsal. You can't fix, any, fix everything in one day. Try to limit to three attempts to correct, improve passage and move on. It's almost like you have a, a toddler sitting there. You're like, okay, you can sit here for 90 seconds or whatever it is. And the minute you start seeing them get antsy, that's when you move on. I mean, I've seen people rehearse and you know, on all state bands, a different story, but with your typical middle school band or high school band, you, have, you know there's this window and you start to read the group and you better be moving on from them and that, that, was, that was a great one. And the last one I wanted to bring up in this section um, is careful not to over-program. This is like my biggest soapbox recently because I mean, if I could live in the grade two area from the rest of my career, I would love it because you know, you're right here, you just, you're always fixing notes and rhythms if you over-program, yeah. right? You're not getting to all the fun stuff that's in music. And that's when it comes to that. Well, if I only had a couple more rehearsals, I, I, you know, you, you know what? You picked music that was too hard, that required more time than you have to work with the students. So why do, why do we pick music that's too hard? I wonder. You know, yeah, because we want to play our favorite pieces or we play. Somebody said, don't program the band that's in your head. Program the band that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's a great line because it's true. Like in your head, you're thinking your band could do this. But like, be real. Like, what is your band really capable of doing? And, and do that. And, and I would much rather hear a band play a grade two piece with beautiful tone, number one, mm -hmm. intonation and phrasing and sh shape dynamics, you know, then play something that's just technically really hard. It's supposed to impress me, but intonation and tone quality, and there's no dynamic contrast. And, it, and, and another thing that I, th I think the real reason we overprogram is just ego. You're like, we're doing Charles Ives. Like, okay. As a friend of mine, Cheyenne Priest says, it, it might be in their folder, it doesn't mean you're, they're actually playing the piece, right? If uh, if you're playing something that's too hard, so it's always good to have a, a stretch piece. There's nothing, but don't sure. do it right. Like if you're going to do a, a Charles Ives piece, then make sure the other pieces on the program aren't nearly as hard, so you can give it the time it deserves. Um, but you got to go to Western Connecticut and played most of Charles Ives pieces. Yeah, 
I agree. Variations on America. How many people you listen to go to festival play that? And I'm sure, Tony, you're sitting there judging and saying, well, why did you pick that piece? Yeah. 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 You're right. You know, 100%. Th there was a piece. There was a, a year. I think it was 2010. And we did the dance on number two. It was the boys in arrangement, mm -hmm. the Marquez. And I thought they, they learned a lot through that. And they played amazing. The concert they played was not their best. And I walked away and I was talking to Alan King, our brass instructor, and and he said, Kyle, you have to understand that once in a while, if they don't sound good in performance, but that might, that's okay if it's overridden by everything they learned through that process. And he said, if that happens occasionally, it's okay. So I was able to kind of step back from that, but still, I didn't even like that happening once. But Tony, I, I'm sure you had this happen to you. You've, you've gone to guest conduct at a regional festival and the last rehearsal was like awesome. And the concert was, well, that was okay. But, you know, the, a lot of the people say they learned more in rehearsal, and that's what they'll take with them for the rest of their lives. And I'm sure seeing all the things you've done over the years, you've had that where you've come, well, that wasn't what we wanted in the final performance, but they learned so much from what we did. And their brains are saturated. Their, their lips and their brains are saturated because those festivals, yeah. they start at 8.30, they rehearse until 4.30, they have dinner, and then they do a concert. At that point, they're like, yeah, they yeah. you know, they're used to being in school and having a, an hour or less of band. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there's another point you have on here that I, again, I think of Terry White, one of my mentors, and it's I didn't even circle it. I don't know why, but play more, talk less. I mean, we all check out pretty quickly when people are talking, especially if the, if the teacher in front of you is not super animated. Right. Kids check out so quickly. So, you know, Phil Edelman says, you know, say it in five words and move on. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. Like that. so, or, and say it with your baton, like learn how to communicate with your baton, what you're trying to get them to do rather than have to talk about it. The modeling just saves the most time. And yeah. if you can't model it, which is fine, because I'd, I'd have student teachers who didn't feel comfortable modeling for an instrument that wasn't their main instrument. Fine. There's a capable kid in the band who can do it. Ask the, ask your first chair clinic, but can you please play that so they can hear how, mm -hmm. how we want? And that just says it all. You don't have to try to put into words all these things that hear it. Oh, emulate that, you know, copy and that, model I, that. I remember from when I talked with Phil Edelman last month, he said he had a kid in the percussion section who was his like stopwatch person. Mm -hmm. And he said, if it went a certain amount of time, it was like 20 seconds or whatever. And I was talking, he would literally just like hold up a stick in the back or whatever. And that, <laughs> that was sort of his constant reminder to not talk too much. Well, Tony, you remember years ago, we'd have Peter Boonshaft come quite often. And Peter would always do this one shtick where we talk about, do a rehearsal and never say a word. Never say a word. And you know, it, it would, it's a shocking experience where for, for 45, 52 minutes, you don't say a word. All you do is all with your hands, with your eyes, pointing to something where you're going to go to the next piece. And how much the kids, they get a little nervous and they realize that, okay, we have to pay attention. But, you know... Uh, it is good. Uh, I, I didn't do it in enough. But I was forced to do it. I, I had, um, I, I performed I, uh, pretty regularly and, and I blew up my voice. I had vocal polyps and nodes and I had a vocal surgery and I literally could not talk for the first two weeks at all. And then it was a whisper. And then it was a month that I could talk, but I couldn't sing for like six months. So it was very limiting. And I was teaching, it was during the school year. Um, they got that surgery done during the, the Christmas break. And anyway, so we had to do rehearsals where I didn't talk. I had this little white board, dry erase marker thing. If I had to write something, but we tried it with just, you know, like rehearsal number this way and, and or, but mostly just baton and cut off and point to which section or it, yeah, but the kids had to really focus. You're right. And then why, you know, then you go back to old habits. As soon as my voice came back, no. Nah, didn't do that. Didn't, you know, I, I should have done more of that. Yeah, it's fun. Is there anything else in this section that we haven't highlighted that you think people need to know about? We recorded ourselves frequently. Um, some of the directors, they wait till the concert, they would play the kids a recording of the concert. Like that's, it's after the fact, like now they're hearing for the first time what they really sound like, they, they, you know, um, it's like when you hear your voice recorded for the first time, it doesn't sound the way you think it sounds because your ears are placed differently than anyone else's. So we record rehearsals all the time and I had these little sheets. I got them from the ASBDA handbook. They had these and then I modified them to my own liking, but they were great little rubric things. And we would play the rehearsal recording. The kids had to fill them out. They had to have critical ears 
and pick out the passages where they would identify that we're struggling with a rhythm here or intonation is a problem here. Or there's balance problems here. And then they had a, they always had to diagnose uh, the problem and then prescribe the solution. And you do that and the kids get really good at, at figuring out how to fix things and not relying on you to mm. tell them this is what you did wrong and here's how to fix it. That's a big that, one. That's yeah. a great idea. And the other thing is that we find with a lot of our administrators saying, well, we, we want to see documentation of the kids doing some writing. Well, that's using listening skills, but there's a writing component to it. So you can say, yeah, here we did it, but it worked on music the whole time instead of writing something for the sake of writing something. Yeah, and you mentioned about playing recordings um, when the kids were coming in. We, uh, if I had recordings or different versions of the same piece I wanted them to hear, we would do it, and there was a compare and contrast sheet. And they would compare what you're hearing, the way we play it, and, what they're, and they would notice, oh, they're playing a tempo faster. Their, their fortes are, are, are stronger, you know, or their pianos are softer. Or, wow, the, I don't hear their breaths, whatever. So compare and contrast was another, but listening to either recordings of themselves or listening to professional recordings and comparing and contrasting. And like you say, Jeff, having to write it down. Yeah. Yeah. Reinforces every, reinforces everything. So it's a good teaching companion for the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, you just mentioned uh, this, ask students to identify um, issues and suggest solutions rather than providing you all the information you were just talking about, letting the students come up with those answers. That's in your develop uh, independent section. And, and I wanted to highlight one of these, you call it the audiation game. Something mm. my wife used to do or still does. And I took from her is sort of a more basic version of this. And I would have people try this and then have, I'm going to have you explain how you do it. And then I want people to try both. Um, when they get back from summer vacation, that is. Um, I, I have the band count one to eight, all out loud. When you get to eight, go back to one. You just keep counting the steady beat. But then when you put your hand up, they just have to think it. And then when you put your hand back down, they have to start saying it again. And they, they might have said one, two, three, four, and then thought five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three. They have to come back in on four. So it gets them to count and audiate, as we say, right? So that's like, like that. the, the basic version. So. Tell us about your audiation game. Yeah, in, in the rehearsal, I think actually we did this at heart with Dr. Alvarez. Um, I think that's when I first saw it done. But uh, we'd be playing a passage, and he'd say, okay, uh, at a random point in time, I'm going to just hold my fist up. As soon as you see that, you stop playing. But you continue to play the piece in your head. And when my hand goes down, you come back in. And when you do that exercise, start small. You know, when you, when, for, uh, one measure, you know, fist goes up, they stop playing. They come back in a measure later, keep playing, stop them, let it go two measures, and then some odd number in the middle of a measure. But it gets them to internalize the beat. For brass players, a guy like me who had trouble hearing the right partials, well, it's really challenging coming in cold when you're hearing your head and you got to come in in the right spot, but you also got to be on the right partial or overtone for the brass. And the kids like that challenge. Uh, they like when we would do that. And then we, you know, the, 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 the contest would be how far can we go? How long can we go silent? Mm -hmm. Continuing to play and everybody be in the right place when you come back in. But That's I, I like a great the, idea. I, I never did that. I did what Kyle did, but I never, that is outstanding. I got to try that. Thank but you. Again, everything on here, I, I just beg, borrow, and steal from other directors I've, I've had the opportunity. Well, that, that's a fabulous idea that, to do it that way when you're playing a piece and they've got to keep time. They, they got to think the notes. They've got to maybe finger them and then come in at the right note when you bring your hand up. Great idea. And you tell them no tapping, your, you, no audible tapping. You can tap your foot inaudible because then if somebody's tapping audibly, then everybody's following that beat. It's got to be silent. That's a big piece of it. Um, the chamber ensemble one is one that I, that I found really effective. Kind of goes back to what Jeff was saying, too, about spot checking and part assignments. So we'd say, okay, today's chamber ensemble day. Count off by fours within every section. Okay, just the ones play right now. So like a quarter of the band is playing. So pretty much usually it'd be like one or two players at most. So it's like a real chamber ensemble. And no conductor, because in, in a chamber group, there's no conductor in front. I'd say you're going to. You know, I'll start you and then you play and I'd step off the podium and and then you say, okay, the twos, now the threes. And don't do it in order because then they know the fours are next. Some days say, let's start with the threes, then the ones and mix it up um, so that the same kids don't always have to go first. But getting them to play and not a long because you're going to lose the kids if they're if you go too long. Just a, a section you've been working on that needed some polishing to see where they're at. And then you can really hear who's getting it, who still needs needs help in a in a large group rehearsal. Um, but that, that uh, creating a chamber ensemble within your 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 big group 
And every, everything in this develop independence number six section is really all about empowering the students to be better musicians. It's like if you're not in the room, making them the best players that they can. You know, we, we have such control issues, which is why I think so many band directors don't like to fly, me being one of them. You know, like we like to control. <laughs> you're not smiling, Jeff. That was a joke. Um, we, <laughs> you know, I, I, we just like to control everything. And the more we can let go and empower the kids. Hence, that goes back to the first question you asked today. What would I, my advice to new teachers yeah. is, is that? Because that's the, we're control freaks. We know how we want things done and uh, you'll burn out quickly unless you learn to, how to effectively delegate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the thing that you're saying, you said you had 40 student teachers over your 30 year tenure. Yeah. yeah. I had a lot, but I never had that many. And that's outstanding because you, you get to see also what, habits you may have had and you say, oh, I'm glad I fixed that. Mm, maybe I need to fix that. I never realized I was doing that. Yeah. And the thing that always used to get me with student teachers, okay, uh, you're going to do such and such piece. And they'll go one, two, one, two, three, four. And I tell you, wh why? You put your hands up and you give the downbeat or whatever beat you come in on. Why waste that time? Because that's two, three, four, five seconds you've wasted counting off for them. They don't need to count off. They need to watch you. Yeah, and it, by counting off, it shows they don't need to watch you. Right. They're, you're telling them, don't bother watching. We're just going to do it. Yeah, and, and some of the things I learned from student teachers that wouldn't change changed what I was doing. Uh, I had the Kodai when I went, was at heart for my um, ear training, and, uh, which was good, and, and it was fine. But we did the ta, ta, teary, teary, t, t, and that was the system – in addition to counting that, that I was using to help kids with the rhythm. And then I have a student teacher come in and they had switched in to the Gordon syllables, which I'd never heard of. And, and the, the Gordon syllables I thought was just so much more practical and could mm -hmm. be applicable to different meters. You can apply the same syllables, whether you're in triple or duple meter. And I switched quickly once I saw how effective that yep. was. And then I had another student teacher who came in and taught me the current, the hand signs and solfeging with the band when we were singing numbers, you know, the, the, the Hindemith, the way we did it. Right. So yeah. I'm like, Oh, this is much more effective to, to do the hand sign and solfege. Cause it doesn't matter what key you're in, you know, um, things like that from student teachers changed my habits along the way for sure. Yeah. yeah, most definitely. So I hope anybody who is listening to this, who is on the fence, whether or not they're going to go to Midwest or not, they need to see this clinic in person. And I hope they pack the room for you, Tony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is an important one. This is yeah. for, especially for uh, the younger teacher and for the older teacher who has forgotten that they should have done these things and they've gotten caught in bad habits. And for those of us, uh, those of us in the middle who just need to learn. Yeah. This is a Midwest is a great experience for everybody. So, so Tony, I was going to ask you a, um, a couple questions as we, as we wrap up. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for young arrangers and composers, maybe especially band directors who you know, want to start getting into the arranging field, um, whether it be published or first, obviously just arranging for their band. W what advice do you have for them? Um, there's a couple, couple of things. In the, in the beginning, I was naive and I was, well, this is back in the day, we had a mail of a manuscript and, and a CD and, and everything was done by hand because there was no finale. I mean, I have scores of stuff. I did the entire score in pencil with but now it's all done online. So go to the website of the publisher you're interested in. Take the time to look at what the different series they have, what the most publishers do, and the, and the music that the type of music that they do. Don't send them something that's not what that doesn't match, you know. Yep. Um, and then on most of the websites now, the publishers have gotten really good about uh, giving you very specific, this is the range of the notes. These are the rhythms for this grade level piece. These are the keys. And if you go outside the box, not that it, it's, 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 it's restrictive sometimes, but at the same token, if you're trying to get your foot in the door, once you're in the door, then you can do what you want, you know, eventually yep. give you more leeway, put it that way. Um, but go to the website. And then they also have very specific, this is the time of year when we're reviewing pieces. Um, they're not reviewing pieces all year round. So you're wasting time sending it at the wrong time. It's going to sit there unheard and you can't pitch to publishers at the same time, you know, yeah. one at a time because no one wants to listen to your piece and then say, yeah, we want to, we want to sign you. And you go, like, Oh, I already, I already signed with someone else. Like yeah, you just bad. wasted their time. Yeah. So you, you, you can't play that game. Um, so just, Go to their site. It'll say when they'll be accepting submissions, when they'll be listening to them. 
And then, like I said, it'll also give you an idea of make sure you're, you're pitching to the right audience as far as the type of music and stuff. Um, but as far as the composition and arranging itself, for me, what, what's worked, because I didn't take composition classes, I would just say, what are my favorite pieces? And then I would take the scores and say, what is about this piece? Why, why do I love this piece? Yeah. And you start looking at what the composer, how they developed the the, the theme and the motive, uh, or what rhythmic things they did that really made it interesting. Every piece has got its its thing that was like, oh, that's what really drew me to this piece. Maybe I got to find a way to incorporate that, incorporate that into my music. But that's for me, for somebody who didn't take composition, yep. studying scores of pieces that I admire and love and figure out, pull it apart. Like, what is it about this piece that makes it stand out that's so good? And then you're like, oh, this color, this combination of these instruments is, is, is that's, you know, it's, it's beautiful. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. That's great. Um, and you provide, for people who are going to Midwest, you provide your email on here. Are you okay if I share that right now? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah the Susie Music one, yeah. That's Susie fine. Music one at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And that's Susie, like S-U-S-I. Um, last thing I'm going to ask for you, Tony, is what's something exciting that you have coming up? Uh, maybe a piece or two that you're really excited about or something happening in the next year that yeah. you'd like to tell people about? A lot of good things. Um, I just got my first contract for a new piece for 2024 from uh, from Blair for the jazz chart. So I'm psyched. They've uh, Excelsior Music now also has Kendor and Blair oversees the jazz department. So it'll probably be a Kendor jazz piece. Um, so that's the first one for next year's releases. I'm waiting. This is the time of year when, when they're reviewing. Yep. I'm waiting. I must have a dozen pieces easily out right now uh, waiting to hear. So yeah. there's anticipation, but hopefully if it was anything like last year, I think last year, 10 out of 14 got picked up, which was nice. Um, great. I'd be thrilled even if half of that, you know, get, gets picked up. So we'll see. And, and um, if there's, if, within a few weeks, if there's one piece of yours that you think people should listen to, what would it be? Uh, that's a really hard question. Great, but I guess it depends on what grade level. Like you mentioned Harvest Fair yeah. for a high school group. Yeah. In fact, that piece so, um, was actually apparently, I uh, heard this from the publisher, uh, owner of Grand Mesa Music said it was recommended to be on Texas required list for their festivals. And I was like, oh, we had Congrats. our fingers crossed. That's festivals. awesome. And for, yeah. But for whatever reason, it, it didn't make the final cut. But just that yeah. it was considered, that was kind of cool. So that that wouldn't be for high school. Um Middle school, I have a lot of stuff right in that middle. I like to write that grade two and a half, grade mm -hmm. two. Um, the one for that's unique, I think, for groups that that have players with limited range or, and rhythmic skills, but that's really uh, a cool experience is Tornado Alley. I've had, a, I've had sixth grade bands do it, eighth grade bands, and high school bands do it. Um, they have it as a grade two and a half. Technically, it's a grade one and a half rhythmically and range wise, but cause it has all these contemporary techniques in there. And basically you're creating a whole tornado yeah. start to finish devastation. And then, and then the, the rebuilding afterwards. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a kind of very unique piece and it could be done. Like I said, I've done it with sixth grades. I've done it with eighth grades and I've had fantastic festival. I heard of Massachusetts high school play it. So. Great. Yeah. Well, Tony, thanks for spending the time with us. Jeff, thanks for spending the time. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeff. I hope good this to is see you again, Tony. Tonight. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. I appreciate the opportunity. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.